So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce the first PyData Cambridge meetup uh, and uh, the second PyData UK meetup. Um, we moved online uh, just recently due to COVID-19. And uh, for this particular event, we decided to do something slightly different. Um, we teamed up with PyData chapters from all over the UK. Um, so we uh, from the Cambridge chapter are chairing this time, but we have contributors and helpers from all over the UK, which is, uh, was really a great initiative to have. Uh, so this gives an overview where uh, in the UK PyData is represented. And if you don't see your city there, just you know have a look at the PyData webpage and consider starting a meetup yourself. Uh, furthermore, there's also uh, a Slack. You can see the URL there, and I'm going to post it on the Slack, uh, on the chat function of Zoom as well. So if you want to uh, connect with other Python enthusiasts all over the UK, or, or just have a, uh, have a general chat about what's, what's going on in the data space in the UK, feel free, feel free to use the chat function after the meetup. A quick overview of the agenda. So I'm going to say a few words here in the introduction. Then uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to start with talks by Ryan Callinghan and Matt Wright and Nicoletta Glinazzi. Then around eight o'clock, we're going to have a, a short break just for everyone to be able to stretch their legs. And then at a quarter past eight, we uh, continue with talks by Nick and Luciano. And we aim to end at about nine o'clock. Um, we have abstracts for all of the talks. So um, feel, feel free to take a look. I don't have time to talk to them right now, but you can find them on the uh, GitHub URL at the bottom of this page. And I posted the link also on meetup.com. So I should maybe say a little bit about um, what we are doing here uh, at PyData Cambridge. So we, we are part of the PyData outreach program by NumFocus. And um, in Cambridge, we have a local chapter which organizes monthly meetups every Wednesday of the month, every last Wednesday. We started in, in 2018 already, so it's been, it's been uh, more than a year now, a year and a half. And uh, we are four volunteers who run this meetup. So um, that's Federico, who unfortunately can't make it tonight, uh, Juris, Leandro, and myself, Ole. So Juris and Leandro are on the chat as well feel free to um, you know, chat to them and introduce yourself if you want to. So I mentioned already NumFocus a couple of times. And um, uh, so I want to explain a little bit better what this is about and hand over to Jim, who is speaking to us from NumFocus in Texas. Thanks, Ellie. I appreciate the invite to talk here. And uh, I'm Jim Weiss. Uh, I'm the events manager for NumFocus, and I'm always happy to talk about, uh, get the chance to talk about PyData and NumFocus. Uh, and people often understandably wonder, you know, what is the relationship between PyData and NumFocus, or even what the heck is NumFocus? Uh, so, real quickly, NumFocus, it's, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are located in Austin, Texas, uh, and our mission focuses around two main areas. Uh, one, we directly sponsor 35 open source projects uh, in the scientific computer programming. Um, and that number is always growing, and they include projects like Pandas and Jupyter and NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib and Bokeh. Uh, and if we could go to the next slide, um, we have all the projects listed here. And, and I invite you to take a look and see which ones you recognize. And uh, maybe there's probably a few that you might use on a day to day basis. Um, so have a look there. Um, and then the second part of our mission is to support the community of users and developers of these open source tools. Uh, and that's where PyData comes in. Uh, PyData is a program of NumFocus. Uh, we, uh, the mission is to provide a forum for a community of users and developers to learn from one another. Uh, each, each year we host conferences all around the world. Um, London is one of our flagships. Um, but we, you know, have conferences all across Europe, in the United States, in Asia, uh, South America. Uh, last year, PyData Cambridge had its first uh, conference, and, you know, we love to see the conference there. We thought it went really well. We're 
really looking forward to seeing what additional opportunities, uh, assuming we come out of a pandemic and we can start hosting conferences again, uh, we'd love to see maybe what the Pied Ages, uh, Cambridge community uh, can do in terms of conferences, but obviously also all the meetups that um, all these chapters in the UK are hosting. Um, they're, they're just really important for the community uh, and that community is like of the users and developers of those open source tools. Um, and so we currently have 173 meetups uh, across the globe uh, in 61 different countries. Uh, and one of the important things we like to share is that uh, any proceeds that come from all PyDate events, um, that's both conferences and, and whatnot, they go to continuing to support uh, our projects. So anytime you attend a conference or make a donation, that money will be used for things like small development grants, financial services, legal services, operational help, promotional support, because we know the open source tools we all use here, uh, they take time, they take effort and dedication from all the volunteers that contribute to them. And support to NumFocus provides us ways to support those projects, uh, enable them to focus on what they do best, which is uh, continuing to contribute and develop those projects. So we always like to first say thank you to everyone for organizing and participating in these events. Your contributions do go a long way in supporting our mission. Uh, I'm bummed I won't be able to see you this year at Pi Data London, Pi Data Cambridge in person. Um, but please, uh, if you ever want to reach out to me or NumFocus, you can either email admin at pydata.org or uh, email me directly at jim at numfocus.org um, if you want to get involved or have any questions. Um, let's go next slide. So if you are interested in getting involved, there are a few great ways to do it. Um, participate in a local meetup. So everyone check, we already, we're already we doing that here. So we appreciate that. Uh, attend a Pi Data conference. As I said, any money, any proceeds from those conferences go to contributing to support the open source tools. Um, and those conferences also need to always need volunteers. So uh, contribute to reaching out. There's usually a call for volunteers. Um, and that's you know what really makes these conferences go. <clears throat> and then if you have a chance, you know, consider donating um, or working with your company. We, we have both sponsorship programs for uh, high data. So conferences themselves have sponsors, but as well as NumFocus has a corporate sponsorship program as well. Um, so either con consider donating or um, talking to your company about maybe getting involved in uh, contributing as well. <clears throat> and um, all that information can be found uh, on NumFocus's website um, or PyData website. Uh, I know it can be a little confusing. We have two separate websites, but it's all one general organization. So please uh, reach out, look for some more information if you're interested, or please uh, email me if you have any questions. Um, and that's pretty much what I have. The next slide is a little map of where all our meetups are right now. Um, so it's, it's growing every day, which is really cool. So I appreciate everyone coming out and uh, joining us. So thanks, Ole. Thanks a lot, Jim. Um, I, I noticed there were two people uh, raising their hands using the Zoom function. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that you cannot actually speak, but if you have a question or if you want to ask something, just post them in the Q&A section, ideally, and, and we will try to respond to that. So I think I saw the names Chi and Mauro, uh, please use the Q&A function and we will respond. Okay, moving on. Um, as we are, as I said, part of the um, NumFocus outreach program, PyData. And as a consequence of that, we are bound by the code of conduct of PyData. Um, I'm going to read it out quickly. It should be all just uh, common sense. Uh, it basically says, be kind to others, do not insult or put down others, behave professionally. And do remember that any kind of harassment, uh, uh, sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes or language are not appropriate for PyData. Um, if you think anything happened during this, this uh, meetup, this virtual meetup that uh, was in breach of this conduct, you, you can uh, contact all of the organizers. You can uh, you can email us on, on meetup.com that has our contact details. We also have like an external contact person as required by, by the PyData Code of Conduct. That's Leonie. She's not part of the organizing team, but she's volunteering to take care of this function. So her email address is at the bottom of this slide. 
Um, now uh, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. First of all, uh, there's IBM. IBM is a num focus sponsors and sponsors them directly. And they also put us in touch with one of the speakers for tonight with Luciano. So we have uh, two speakers or two um, employees of IBM on the chat. It's Tim and, and Luciano, the speaker. So if you have any questions, please you know, feel free to talk to them. Um, the PyData Cambridge Meetup is also supported by a couple of companies that are based in Cambridge. Um, so uh, there is ARM, which uh, Fetch AI and Raspberry Pi Foundation, I should say. Um, so these companies support the meetup in various ways. ARM um, uh, sponsors Pizza, Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, provides us with the venue, and Fetch AI makes a contribution to our travel expenses. So obviously all of these things are currently not really used because of uh, the coronavirus lockdown, but uh, nevertheless, we are indebted to of these companies. And last, last but not least, of course, NumFocus. Um, just some information uh, about the sponsors. Um, I'm going to put a link of these slides uh, on, or to these slides on the Meetup page so you can refer to it afterwards in case you're interested in any of the details. Um, ARM, as I said, uh, is uh, based in Cambridge, but a global company and uh, in the chip design business, in, especially with a focus on energy saving chips. So if you have an Apple mobile phone, it's very likely that a chip based on a design by ARM is in that mobile phone. And if you're interested in their careers, please check them out. Um, FetchAI is a, a company based in Cambridge. Uh, supports uh, us uh, with, uh, with travel grants. So if we get speakers from other countries, we can reimburse their uh, travel costs. Um, FetchAI is in the business of machine learning and, and decentralized uh, uh, transactions and blockchain. So they uh, recently launched a demo which shows the journeys of train times um, uh, all over the UK and uh, are working on an agent-based framework that allows uh, users to start autonomous agents and, and fulfill certain tasks for these users. So for instance, performing bookings or um, monitoring parking spaces. So if that sounds interesting and cool, please do um, check them out. They have several um, academic presentations online and uh, they have also vacancies um, on, their, on their careers website. Uh, the link will be on meetup.com afterwards. As I mentioned already, we have uh, uh, the special honor to have IBM as a sponsor in this meetup. So I'm going to hand over to Tim from IBM to uh, give you a quick update. Please go ahead, Tim. Unmute. You're fine, Anton. Oh, I'm hey, can you, guys, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Well, uh, so my name is Tim Bonneman. I'm part of the IBM Data Science Community team. We're super excited to be here today and be part of this event. Um, the uh, IBM Data Science Community is a, an online space uh, for data scientists, for machine learning engineers, for um, AI developers, and others in this space. Um, it's for intended for data scientists by data scientists. We have a lot of resources, lots of learning um, opportunities and uh, yeah, are growing at a pretty fast pace. We just crossed 10,000 uh, in May and already at 12,000. So um, pretty good momentum. Um, I focus on global meetup outreach. Uh, we try to connect with leading meetups uh, in, in key tech hubs around the world, um, uh, which have a, a, a good focus on data science and AI and see if we can support them through speakers, occasional sponsorships, and in the before times, uh, venue space, hopefully, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, we get back to that at some point soon. Um, so if you're interested in, in, uh, in getting a speaker, just get in touch with me. Um, I look forward to the event, uh, enjoy, thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, before we start with the talks, uh, just uh, one more uh, um, request for, for speakers. 
Um, so we will try to keep this momentum going and want to have regular virtual meetups. Um, so if you're interested in speaking, just reach out to us. We have a Twitter account, we have an email account. And of course, also always interested in talking to sponsors. So if you're interested in sponsoring uh, PyData or the PyData Cambridge meetup, please do get in touch as well. And um, without further delay, I would like to um, hand over to our first speaker for the evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Callahan from Relative Insight and who's also organizing PyData Lancaster. And he's going to speak to us about why does my NLP model suck in production, which got 96.72% accuracy during validation. Ryan, the stage is yours. Hello. Um, if you can't hear me, then let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to assume that everyone can hear me. Um, could you enable screen sharing for me, please? Well, while that's being sorted, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan, like Ola said. Um, and oh, looks like screen sharing is there. OK. And I'm going to assume that everyone can see my screen, and you will tell me if not. Um, all right. So anyways, hello. Um, like Ola said, I am the organizer of, uh, not the, one of the organizers of PyData Lancaster. Uh, and for today, I have used um, our template, slide templates. So I just crossed out Lancaster. Uh, I'm the lead data scientist and computational linguist at Relative Insight. Uh, Relative Insight is a uh, language analysis platform which lets language data speak for itself using a mixture of hand-tailored NLP and corpus linguistic um, techniques, uh, along with a simple to use UI. We don't wanna, just because we can show you all the data that we possibly can, we choose to try to only show you what is um, uh, beneficial for you, your project and your business. Um, but uh, yeah, as you can, Probably here, I don't sound like I am from the UK. Uh, it's because I'm a native Californian uh, who moved to the tropical uh, Northwest England, which actually is pretty nice today. Um, and I'm an avid antique postcard collector. Um, just before we get started though, uh, with, with the actual talk, I just want to uh, emphasize one thing that I, my background is actually in linguistics. Um, I, I was a linguist for many years, um, taught, uh, I taught, uh, English as a second language, um, but decided that I needed to look for something else to do uh, because I wanted to make more money. And uh, I got into computational linguistics uh, and uh, got my master's in that. And NLP is just one of the things that computational linguistics deals with. It does a lot of, uh, deals with a lot of research as well. But uh, I guess the, the practical side is NLP. So, uh, the uh, title of this talk is Why Does My NLP Model, which got 96.72% accuracy during validation, suck in production? So uh, this talk is, is aimed at people who might have some experience with NLP or have heard, uh, uh, heard of NLP before and have found some really good tutorials online because they wanted to do something like text classification or uh, keyword extraction, um, sentiment analysis. And they, they follow these tutorials and can make a really nice model uh, in no time at all. But then when they actually go to use it, it sucks. And why? They don't know why. Um, and yeah, uh, and over the next couple of minutes, we'll be hopefully uh, addressing some of those things. So let's start, uh, let's set the stage. Let's start with creating a sentiment analysis model. So first we have to go get data, right? We're data scientists, we have to have data. Uh, so um, I go online and I find a nice, nicely curated sentiment analysis uh, data set. One that is um, quite, uh, quite famous online is the IMDB data set. It is a whole bunch of different uh, reviews from IMDB and uh, the sentiment of those uh, statements, whether they are positive or negative, one and zero, respectively. Um, and as you can see, that's, uh, that's what we have here. So then we do a little bit more uh, NLP type stuff. We wanna actually make the data usable 
for a model. So we do some pre-processing, we do some tokenization, which is splitting up the, uh, the words um, or tokens if you're into that sort of thing, uh, into bite-sized bits. And then you do a little bit more research and you find out, ooh, stop words, stop words. These are these words that contain no meaning, um, like the, in, and, or. I'm just gonna remove all those because that's, that's not content, I don't need those. And you're left with a nice uh, tokenized um, sentence in the end without stop words. Uh, as you can see, uh, I don't know if everyone here can see my mouse, but I'm gonna assume you can. As you can see, uh, it is nicely tokenized. Um, and then we do a little bit more research and we uh, want some to actually extract features from that. So we use TF-IDF, uh, which not going into what that is exactly, but you do some research and you find out that it's really efficient and it sort of emphasizes uh, content words and that's good. Uh, so we're gonna use that. Then we throw together another throw together a nice uh, Keras model, uh, a little deep learning model because when you say deep learning, people throw money at you, um, and start training it. And just after 10, 10 epochs here, you can see that our loss is getting low and our accuracy is getting high. What more could you possibly want? Um, and then finally, we have our model in the end. Everything's peachy, and we test it on some sentences. Now, some context here. Um, like I said, I'm from California. Uh, tacos are my favorite food. Uh, so I wanted to see some uh, examples with tacos. Um, now, in England, where I currently live, tacos are absolutely terrible, which is a true statement. Sorry if that offends anybody. Um, and it is very negative, which is reflected in our uh, model. But then if I just misspell, misspell one word, it jumps to highly positive. That's kind of weird. And then tacos in Prague are not so bad. I was able to find some really good tacos in Prague. Now that statement is, is pretty positive actually, but our model is saying it's kind of negative. Uh, and then like, I'm a big fan of tacos. That's also saying it's kind of neutral, kind of negative, where it's clearly positive, right? So something went wrong here. Something is wrong with our model. Uh, it got really good accuracy, but what happened here? Uh, so let's go through a couple things. Uh, first of all, language is not skin deep or surface deep. Um, so text, just from a practical point of view, is a bunch of Unicode characters usually are ASCII if you're old school, um, strung together. And then those sort of characters can be strung into words and then those words into sentences and what are sentences, what is a word. Um, so let's just take a word like spring. If I were to ask you, just without context, what does the word spring mean? Uh, many of you would give me different answers. Some of you would be like, oh, well, I guess it depends. It could be uh, water, it could be a season, it could be a piece of machinery, it could be jumping, it could be a lot of things. Um, and we don't get that just from the surface form of a word. Uh, but then even if we have uh, context, so we take the second um, example there, the UK has the best weather in the world. Um, I'm sure there's some crazy people who may think that's true, but most people will probably agree that that is uh, sarcasm or irony. Um, but just from the surface form of that sentence, uh, you, you can't really get that with a computer from that sentence alone. You need some sort of outside knowledge and context. So language is more than just the, the, the characters put together. So also, let's just take a bunch of words. So this, in this case, we have a bunch of words. Now, if you see all these words together, does this have any meaning to you? Maybe you can have an idea of which direction is, this is going, but it doesn't actually mean anything. That's because language is all tiny wimey. It has, it's a, it's a sequence. Um, things that go before another thing affect other things, and this is connected to that. But if you just kind of reduce uh, language to a set of words and then put those in a bag and shake it all up, and that's where you get a uh, bag of words if you've heard of that term, um, you lose a lot. You get some things, but you don't get a lot of things. Uh, so you actually need, need some structure for language. Um, now, uh, there's actually some structure to this little tree that I drew here. Uh, it's, called, it's called a syntax tree. It's one way to represent um, the structure of a sentence. And from this, you can see that all of those words that we saw here have been organized into a nice sentence. And you can actually connect, okay, so we have should, um, should not. Okay, those things should go together, but what are those talking about? Well, it's pineapple and pizza, so should not pineapple pizza. Whereas you have another should in the sentence, but there's no not. So pina colada pineapple. Okay, so that's, that's 
a very different sort of should because it has uh, doesn't have not. Um, all this to say that uh, that you use a lot by reducing language to just a set of words. So you need to have um, other things, and you need to know how language itself works, how the the bits and pieces fit together. Um, and you may have learned some of that in uh, in, in your younger schooling days and then promptly forgot it. Uh, but uh, with NLP, it's quite important. So another thing that uh, may have made our model not very good is uh, the data. Um, our models will only be as good as the data that we put into them and not all data is created equal. So in the case of our model, um, if you remember it was IMDB, which is all uh, film reviews and movie reviews. Um, and if I'm talking about tacos, that's not really in the sort of realm of movie reviews, is it? Uh, I would have ideally wanted uh, more, more sentences talking about food or maybe a whole data set just about tacos. That would be great. Um, I don't know how useful it would be, but I guess for my model, it would have been useful. Uh, so you, you want to make sure that your data is fit to purpose. Uh, if you're analyzing uh, social media data, you don't really want a model that's trained on medical data or vice versa. Um, and general models can be quite good, but there's even problems with very general models. Um, a lot of the sort of word embeddings that you see nowadays um, are trained on very general swaths of, uh, of language from the internet. Um, and that's great. You can get, there's a lot of great uh, examples of language on the internet. That's how we communicate. We're very candid and open when we when we uh, speak on the internet. Um, but there is a major danger, uh, and I have experienced this with uh, many a model. Um, where uh, so an, an actual concrete example is I was using uh, word embeddings to get to extract sort of meanings of words uh, and 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 their relation to other words. And what I was finding was that my data and my model was very, very racist and sexist in a lot of areas. Uh, a lot of words that had to do with power and and strength and leadership um, had a very male tinge. They were they were connected to uh, words about men, like man, for example. Um, and those were those those vectors were kind of clustered around each other, whereas uh, a lot of the vectors about dealing with family, and then a lot of uh, sexual words were clustered around women. Um, now, usually you don't want that sort of sexism and racism in your data, and if you're getting, or in, in your model, and if you're getting your data from just the internet as a whole, and you've spent any amount of time on the inter internet, you'll know that uh, it's not always the most benevolent, benevolent place. So um, garbage in, garbage out, your model is only as good as, uh, as the data you put into it. Now, uh, some of you more savvy NLP people, um, you may be wondering, well, what about BERT? Um, if you're not familiar with BERT, um, aside from being a character from a children's TV show, um, BERT is a model, it is a language model that uh, was very expensive to train, a very big model that essentially creates uh, the word uh, word representations based on context uh, that you can then use in various other NLP models. Um, and encoded in these vectors, they found has been meaning, sentiment, um, grammar, uh, kind of all, all packed into these vectors. And it is very good, but it is not perfect. Um, and can cause problems. Just remember my previous example of racism and sexism. Um, so that's that's a problem. Um, also, these models are not small um, and they're not cheap. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, with some of the bigger models, just to train one model took something like, I think it was like $200,000 or more just to train the model and uh, uh, actually have the architecture uh, hosted somewhere um, takes a lot of power. To make it fast and usable for your system. So that's um, just because they are really, really good doesn't mean that it is feasible. Um, and also, language is always changing. Uh, so these models um, do react well to 
uh, context, but if uh, people start using language in a different way or create a new word or uh, change the meaning of a word, a word like yeet is added to the language or a word like ratchet changes meanings, um, that, that won't necessarily be affected. So you'll constantly have to retrain and retrain and retrain these. Not a big problem, I guess, but if you have the money and resources, but for smaller companies, it may be a problem. Um, and who knows, in the future, we may be uh, getting to where we're being able to be completely unsupervised in our models, but um, that hasn't happened yet. And it doesn't seem like it will happen for quite some time. So I think I am drawing to the end of my time here. Uh, so to conclude, um, that wasn't comprehensive. Uh, it, it was just a couple of things based on, on the one example uh, that I showed you of what can go wrong um, in, in, in your NLP models. And what it kind of comes down to, to me is that uh, you have to have a little, little bit more of a meta understanding of language to effectively diagnose problems. Uh, language is, is always changing. It's not a static thing. Uh, grammar is not even a monolithic thing. Yes, there are grammar rules, but um, that's more of a, a prescriptive man-made construction. The, the way language actually works is however people use it. Um, and there's uh, a lot of different ways that people do that. Um, and there's no wrong way to use language, but uh, understanding how language is changing, where it's going, uh, needs someone with that, with that knowledge. Um, and then also, uh, NLP has, has gotten quite good in the past couple of years if you're dealing with English. But if you are, uh, if you speak any language other than English, um, uh, you will know that language technology is not always comparable as it is for, uh, for English. Um, and, and different languages will function very differently from each other. And there's some things about other languages that are extremely important that are not important in English, so the research is just, just isn't there. And until then, we will still need linguists to do some of that work. Um, and I think that is it from me. Um, and I will be monitoring the Q and A uh, system if you have any questions. And I believe these slides will be available somewhere after this presentation. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the. Yes, Ryan. Thank you very much for for the presentation. Um, yes, uh, we, we will post the slides online. Um, so um, we will we will put up on put them on the meetup page. Um, I didn't I didn't see any questions on the Q and A. So please uh, ask uh, Ryan afterwards or uh, during the break. Um, maybe a quick question for me: uh, If you had if time and money wasn't an issue, would you choose more data or a better model? Um, if, if, ooh, if time and I, I think I would choose better data because um, a lot of these models, anyone can get their hands on nowadays, but having uh, a really high quality data set is something not everyone has because they're extremely boring to create and take a lot of time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, who is Matt Wright. Uh, I think Matt has a, a deserves an honorary prize. He's uh, dialing in uh, from uh, New Zealand, I believe, to a very, uh, very uh, difficult hour for him. I think it must be the early morning. So um, thank, thank you very much for that. And he's going to speak about uh, to us about building NLP products. Well, good afternoon, evening, morning for me, everybody. Um, yeah, I'll shout if you can't hear or, or see, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll assume you, that you all can. Yeah, so apologies if my voice is um, not quite right yet. I'm literally the first, you know, you're the first people that I've spoken to all day. So, um, right, I've, we've only got 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna, I'm actually gonna kind of whiz through this. Um, so please reach out afterwards or, you know, stick your hand up and ask a question as we go along. But the, 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 the summary of my talk is going to be the, the sweet spot between 
where we do uh, machine learning and and where product management like helps build build great products. And so my background is I used to work in investment banking, um, mostly in like data processing, like running lots of uh, trading systems, large data processing there. Um, and then I ran my own startup and I'm on the board of another startup and my partner is a product manager. So we've always had this conversation about where, you know, uh, where the res where the research stops and where the where the product begins, and I think there's a really um, sweet spot in the middle of that Venn diagram where you kind of see magical outcomes. And and actually, I I I think it's it's also um, not something that either either group do particularly well. Um, so it's something that I've been concentrating on, and I've run a consulting company um, where we concentrate on helping people with this exact problem. So that's sort of whistle stop to over the background. Um, what we're going to do this today is I'm going to uh, run you through a project that a um, couple of projects that I've worked on and it's all to do with uh, trademark law. So I think I can hopefully teach everybody to be a trademark lawyer in like maybe less than a minute here. Uh, and then we can talk about how we, we automated some of the stuff and what product concerns we have. Um, and then I can hopefully share some of the things that you could look out for. So uh, trademark law. Um, typically this is when you have two trademarks and they they either clash or they don't clash. It's not more complicated than that. Um, so you have, so an example would be, uh, you have an existing trademark, Nokia, and someone tries to register a trademark called Nokian. And, and a lawyer will say, are these things uh, orally, visually, or conceptually similar? And if they are, then they'll find that um, there's, a, there's a clash between them and they'll rule in favor of whichever one is, it was sort of their first. The goods and services are important. So, I mean, if you're talking about Nokia for phones versus Nokia for shoes, then that's not the same thing. So there's a, there's a sort of, uh, they actually have their own taxonomy and classification system for the world of things. So um, that that is a thing called the Nice classification system. So there's, there's some element there that comes into the rulings, but there's tons and tons and tons of fun little edge cases. So here are some other ones. Uh, you know, and you can sort of you look look down this list, and you think, okay, yeah, all right, okay, I scout versus scout, yeah, that that's probably the same. Red dragon, green dragon, oh, there's an interesting one there. Like, what are the concepts? Red and green, do we compare those the same or not? Um, do things, you know, Canex and Chamex, they sound the same. So you can you can almost see just from the first few examples of like, okay, well, look. I'm a NLP person, like I'll throw some Levenstein distance at this and I'll use, you know, word to vec to do some conceptual comparison and, you know, and you're like, okay, I could write, I can write code for this. Um, however, I would urge people not to do that <laughs> because when we, when we did this, you know, uh, that particular first version of this project, you know, we, we sort of, this is exactly the point to put the brakes on. Um, and to switch over into product management land and to think about doing some form of discovery. And, you know, discovery is a fancy word. You know, you can call it user research, you can call it analysis, whatever you want. Um, the important thing is that you stop before writing code and start talking to people. Um, and and the, the thing there is, so we, the way that the discovery that we used on that particular project, and I'm not, partic not fussy on any of them, um, we used a Google design sprint, which is like a, a week long um, effort where you end with a prototype on a Friday. Um, and, and largely it's to do with um, getting the right people in the room and, and talking and, and listening and trying to figure out a, a single um, problem to focus on. But what we found in, for, for that process was the, the product that we were trying to build was actually, you know, it was, it was to do with comparing trademarks, but actually at least 50% of it was to do with automating a workflow that they already had existing. And they used to produce these like terrible reports um, and spend ages, like one of the things they did was like, just because it was a Word document, was just like literally copying and pasting when they had to order, they had to order a list and they had to move things around and they spent half their time like going, oh, actually item number 76 should be in like place number three, move that and then move another one and move another one another. And, and you know, you're like, wow, I could, um, we could build an interface to do that. And they will like literally save you half the time. And things like that are the difference between, you know, getting your, a product to work and your product not to work. And there's sometimes um, very simple things, you know, like forgetting, forgetting the machine learning. And in fact, our very first project, I think we did uh, like 80 lines of Python, you know, like it, that, that could be considered anything like, and it wasn't really any machine learning and it was hardly any NLP. And we actually used mainly libraries that were already existing 
and it was some some basic algorithms and actually that nearly got them the whole way so i think the you know the the key point there is um be careful about writing too much code when you could solve the actual problem so the second part of this project was around um trying to automate um decisions from the european court so if these type of trademark resolutions uh, disputes go to court, they they typically go to the European Intellectual Property Office and they make some sort of ruling. And luckily for us, they have a half decent online resource of all the previous decisions that they've made. So our, our, the second part of this goal was, OK, can we look through all of the data and can we then produce a predictive model that will say, given two new trademarks, what is the likelihood um, of confusion between them based on the court cases that currently exist? So this is definitely more machine learning. Um, and the usual sort of start, you know, the data is, you know, I mean, I think when I sat in the meeting at the end of this project where we went through the uh, results with the, with the sponsors and everybody they, one of their main takeaways was wow wasn't it quite a lot of effort to clean all the data you know i mean we all know that i guess intrinsically but it was kind of nice to have a client that like really recognized that that was a, not only an important part but like a key part of um of getting the project to work so that's that's another thing where it's not necessarily product management but you know getting the right level of buy-in from people to make sure that the data is clean and if you can get them to do some annotation, this is the lawyer. They're expensive. They look. He looks expensive. This is an actual client, um, and they did a lot of annotation because not every single case was clear. Like sometimes you compare one word with another five words, and they choose arbitrarily which word they're going to make the decision on. There's many, 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 many edge cases um, that could throw the model off. So great that you can have somebody that will. Um, do lots of labeling and share lots of feedback um, and and is engaged on making the making the data better so that's that's a big win um, I don't want to like we got really good results so actually largely this is you know good good for us hooray um, but also like good for the European courts because they do seem to make consistent sets of decisions based on data so cool um, and all the numbers are down there. I don't want to go into like machine learning numbers, but um, they're, they're good, good set of numbers. Um, the tricky part of this project, and we've not, not got loads of time, so I want to concentrate on the second part a bit more, was you can go to a lawyer and you can say, put these two words into this, these two text boxes. And when you push this button, I will tell you whether the European court says they will clash or not. And they basically don't believe you. So the main, the main you know, like, I say if you divided this project up, it would be like maybe one third data cleaning, one third building the model, and one third maybe more actually, um, maybe twenty percent building the model, um, and the rest of the time would be building the user interface and building um, some way of explaining the results. So one of the things we used here is uh, Shapley values, which I I hope people have go and have a look at because. They're actually a terrific way if you've got a tree-based model of of explaining the results um, and, and like not not so much um, just which features were important in general in building the model but like on a per prediction basis so you say given this prediction which of the features were activated um, and so that way you can help hopefully help explain um, where your um, where where your model's making predictions and this is another thing, actually, when we're talking about product management. So our model, we ended up doing a bunch of feature engineering. And uh, I think that I got the best set of numbers with like 30 features. Um, but I actually got really good numbers with 14 features. And I think I lost 1% or 2% in the, in, the, in the discarding of 16 features. And so that was actually seemed like a really worthwhile trade-off because when it came to doing this part, which was explaining things, I only had to explain, you know, 14 things instead of 30 things. And actually that made a big difference in terms of the user interface and the understanding of, of the client. Um, so the biggest number isn't necessarily the most important thing when you consider the overall uh, project and delivering systems to people. So do go and have a look at Chapley values. They're very, very cool. And I hopefully I'll get time to write a um, Medium article on, on one of the aspects of this project where we used 
uh, generate the Shapley values and then use the Shapley values inside our nearest neighbors model to generate, which we'll see an example of in a second because I'm going to do a demo. But I was, I've not seen people do that before and I got very good results. So I, I feel like I want like, A, I want to share it, but B, I would actually like somebody to, and if anybody wants to volunteer for this, this would be great, um, to like sort of peer review like the, the idea, this idea, because I, I kind of like part of it is, uh, you, I just would like to talk that over with somebody. But yeah, if anybody wants to volunteer that, then um, yeah, let me know afterwards. Right. So another quickly whizzing through all these things now. Um, one of the important things here is once you've built your model and you've decided to do some explanations, you've obviously got to build some user interface. Um, and there are actually some, there's a great book, um, the link is in the top, I'll put it in the notes afterwards, um, around using a certain set of concepts to explain your model and some of these things. This is where, you know, there's a really good explanation of Shapley values there. There's also, um, yeah, it's, it's not long, it's quite to the point. Um, and we use some of the ideas in here about providing counterfactual examples as one of the things, um, turning things into text, you know, removing, um numbers um and and you know using colors where you could where, where you use the number categorizing things into into small medium and high versus giving absolute numbers all these types of things um so there's some excellent um you know and and the other thing i suppose is sort of uh iterating madly uh, until you until you get something that people are happy with so i'll just do a quick demo here let me see if i can get this to work uh, I'll just put that in the middle because it'll probably show a little nicer. So we had Nokia versus Nokia in that one to start with. Right. So it's not complicated, right? It's two boxes and a button. Um, right. I'll quickly go through what's happening here. Um, and then we'll do a couple of examples and then I'll wrap up. So what we're doing here is we're taking the earlier trademark. Oh, I've got them run the wrong way, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and we're, we're providing an, like an overall headline prediction, which is saying, yeah, these things are likely to be confusing, right? So you actually don't need to go any further than, further than, than that if you don't want to. But we're also providing a, a probability. So actually, this is the, you know, the, the prediction probability. Um, but we've turned that into like a sliding scale so that people, because this is, you know, talking to lawyers, so they don't really want to see numbers. But we're pretty confident about this one. Um, and then we used... Um, these cards, which are text descriptions of why this has happened. So the, you know, the look, you look at the two marks, they're visually similar, particularly towards the beginning. They're highly, they're one, one mark is inside another mark. That's actually a really important legal rule. They're around the same size. They sort of sound the same. Um, and yeah, these two are sort of related. So this is actually really challenging because you, these are, this is the output of the Shapley value. Um, and, and, Quite often you find that this is one of the reasons I cut down the features to like as smallest number possible, because the way that a lawyer will do this analysis is a sort of first principles approach where they will take the legal rules and build up one principle upon another. And what we've done is the sort of the exact opposite, really, which is just said, oh, we don't have any principles. We've got some features, but we'll just we'll just do what the data says and translating those two things. Uh, or back translating from what our model says into what a lawyer might use as an, a piece of analysis is actually really tricky. So, um, you know, we, we've done some information hiding here so that you don't look at all the rest of them um, because these are the most important ones and there's a sort of cutoff and threshold limit. And this, it's not always the first six, it's the most important um, number. Uh, so that, that changes depending on the prediction. And then the other thing we've done here, which is, is actually really... Uh, I'll show another example where the where the cases are a bit more spread out. Is place the this is probably the most important thing, is placing the um, prediction inside the context of all of the other cases. So we went and built this nearest neighbors model, which shows for this particular prediction, what are all the other cases that are like this case, and what what do they say? So there's lots of other cases that are like this case. They're all they're all found to be confusing. So Nokia and Nokia. I like all of these other cases and you can sort of see why, right? Because they are basically, you know, very much nearly the same word, Elisa and Lisa, right? Um, 
that's great. If the cases are really close, you want to see the cases where this is the, the opposite is true. So if you have cases where there is no similarity, but the words are really close, I'd like to investigate those. And this basically just gives a lawyer like uh, something to anchor their um, the prediction on and actually something to go to court with. And we've had a case, we've had some cases where they, they use this system to go to the European court and say, look, um, here are the cases that you ruled on in the past that are like this case. Uh, and we think, you know, blah. And and that's actually really powerful. Um, and, and the interesting thing there is that the, the, the model to, that we use to make the prediction, which is a random forest model, is actually not the same as the model that we use to make, to build a similar, similar cases model. So you don't necessarily have to use the same model for presentation as you do for um, prediction. Uh, let me do one more and then we'll, I'll just, you know, finish up. So this one is red dragon, green dragon. And so a bunch of different features will get activated. You'll see the, okay. So, right. This is a more interesting case where you, you know, actually this rule is triggered, which is that they're conceptually very similar if you remove the suffix. So red and green are actually really similar. But of course, they don't start the same. They don't sound the same at the beginning. Um, so there's some um, there's some indecision about how confident we are around that. But if you look at the similar cases and you place this little green dot as our case, and you place it in the context of a whole bunch of other cases, then you can find some really interesting ones. Like there's a really good one down here where it's like Star Wars versus Space Wars, or you have, oh yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, here we go. Space Wars versus versus Star Wars. So that's actually going to be a really similar case that I would want to go and have a look at and say, well, I removed the last two words and these two concepts are really similar and they were found to be confusing. And if I can find a bunch of cases like that, um, I can ignore the ones that don't that aren't appropriate for me, and I can concentrate on the ones that I do think are appropriate, and that will really help. And that is actually probably an important point to jump off back to the next set of slides, which is, of course. You know, we 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 were really good at prediction, but we we we're we're actually a tool, and I think this is always an important thing to remember. That is very much an assistive tool. You know, like at the end of the day, the lawyer picks and chooses from the results that we give them, uh, and and makes their own um, uh, builds their own set of evidence and makes their own set of decisions. All right. So tips and tricks at the end. Um, don't do any NLP <laughs> in your in your first effort. Try and do some discovery. Um, yeah, really difficult these these ones of trying to get your you know designer um, to learn about machine learning and your your machine learning engineer to learn about design. I spent a whole startup's worth of people trying to teach that one. It's, it's hard, but it's worthwhile. Get your client to focus on some labeling. That that's great. Um, yeah, concentrate on on. I mean, I think the the, the final points of to um, to go over here is that I think every part of our project that project could have been better. You know, like the, we end to end the whole thing uh, in 14 weeks. So so many like not shortcuts, but just when you you know when you're building a product, you need something that will go to market. And I'm not say, suggesting by any means that people just throw throw things out there because you'll end up with all sorts of um, model problems. But there is a point at which you know, you have to stop and kind of move on. And also you can be very creative about um, using user interface to um, give your give your meaning. Um, and I think that's probably it. Sorry, I've gone a little bit over, but uh, there we go. No problem. Thanks for the talk, Matt. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I see. Just have a quick look at the chat. Answered. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's uh, nothing yet for you. So just two questions that I have for you. Number one: uh, Are you are you uh, happy to share your slides? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I can, and, I can share the slides. Yeah. And and does the uh, does the lawyer know that he is in your slides? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He knows the project is about him. Uh, yeah, I think I can't remember because this is the, like the third time I've given this talk. So I did, <laughs> I did certainly ask permission. Um, 
He's actually also a judge, so you know, watch out. <laughs> oh right, okay, yeah, but better be careful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's move on to the next talk, which is uh, by Nicoletta Glinazzi from the University of Cardiff. Um, uh, I I'm really extremely happy that we have speakers from all over the UK represented. So we had um, Ryan from Lancaster. Uh, we have Nicoletta from Cardiff and uh, later on we have Nick from Edinburgh. So it's really like we cover all, all corners. Um, so Nicoletta, the stage is yours and you're going to speak about a bibliometric study of a research field. Yes, that is great. Thank you very much, Oli. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, also, Oli, you're pronouncing my last name uh, really well, uh, which is good for a change. Um, <laughs> That was actually causing me quite a lot of anxiety. So. Uh, it was really good. It was really good. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicoletta. Uh, like Ole said, uh, I'm based in Cardiff. Uh, so I'd like to uh, open this, uh, talking a little bit about myself and my research interests. So uh, I am a PhD student uh, at Cardiff University in the Department of Mathematics. And I submitted my thesis uh, two weeks ago. Um, I studied uh, game theory, and more specifically, I studied uh, a game that is called uh, The Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, it's, uh, it's, quite a po it's a quite popular game. Uh, the Prisoner's Dilemma models uh, situations of conflict between two individuals, and my entire PhD has been about understanding uh, the emergence of uh, what behavior emerges uh, for these um, situations of conflict. Uh, and actually, um, the second uh, logo that you can see um, right here, uh, what is showing is how uh, behavior emerges over time. Uh, and it's also the logo of an open source package uh, that is called uh, Axrod uh, Python library, uh, which is a project to simulate uh, interactions of the prisoner's dilemma. And I am now uh, um, a main contributor uh, to the project. Uh, I'm also a fellow of this uh, Software Sustainability Institute. Uh, the SSI is an institute based here in the UK. And the aim of the Institute is to make sure that researchers, uh, such as myself, uh, when we write code uh, to conduct our research, we make sure that the code is available, is written following best practices, and it is reproducible. And unfortunately, these practices are, are not always uh, standard uh, in academics, in academia. Uh, finally, I am a coach and uh, organizer of Jungle Girls uh, workshops. I've been co-organizing the Jungle Girls uh, UK workshop for the past three years. So when I started my PhD, I came across uh, the illustrated guide to a PhD written by Matt Might. Uh, you can find the guide uh, at the link uh, on the slide. And, and just to summarize uh, what Matt very nicely said uh, in his guide was that if you assume that the bounds of the human knowledge are within this um, outer white circle, and then the way us as individuals uh, will learn during our early years when we're in school and in high school is in a circular way. And that is because we're being taught in several topics and several subjects. However, once we decided uh, to do an undergraduate, uh, our knowledge starts deviating uh, towards the bound, but only in a specific direction. Uh, so for example, this is me choosing to do my undergraduate, and this is me choosing to do my master's degree. Now what a PhD is, is about taking you from wherever you are to the bounds of the human knowledge. And if your PhD is successful, what you manage to do is push that bound a tiny bit. Now, in order to understand where the bound is, in order to push it, uh, you need to understand what other people uh, researches before you have done, uh, what methods they have used and what methods they have not used. Uh, and in order to do that in academia, we use something that we do uh, a literature review. So in order to conduct a literature review, you need to read academic articles that have been published by other researchers. Now, academic articles are very uh, accessible through the web. And for example, if I wanted to find an article that has the world, the word uh, game theory modeling in the title, I would open my browser uh, on Safari. I would type game theory model and would press enter and would click on the first link that, I come, that comes out. And here's an example of uh, what, you know, clicking on the look uh, looks like. Uh, so, for example, we are on the uh, website for the Publisher Science Direct, and we can see this up here. And there are several informations associated with the article and not just the article itself. Uh, so, for example, we can see the name of the journal, uh, we can see the, the title, we can see the authors, uh, I'm one of them, and you can see the abstract. 
Uh, now, the several publishers, and within my field, the several prominent publishers, and an example is a list of examples is Nature, Plus, IEEE, Springer, and the preprint server archive. Now, all of them have uh, websites that you can visit if you know to access uh, their articles, uh, but they also um, provide uh, users an API. So it's a fastest, um, nicer way to collect uh, an, a large number of articles. Now, there are several ways to talk to the APIs. Uh, by myself, I built a library a few years ago, uh, which is called Arcas. Uh, Arcas is written in Python. You can pip install it. And what you can do is that you can communicate through Arcas with those APIs. Uh, so just to show you an example, uh, what would you have to do would be, I would have to import uh, Arcas as uh, so you import any other library. Here I'm creating an instance of the class PLOS, which means I will be communicating with the API of PLOS. Uh, what I want to do is to look for uh, an article uh, that has in the title and in the abstract the word game, and this is highlighted here. I want one article, I want one record, and I want the article to be at start one, so when um, the answer comes back from the API, I want the article at position one. This method creates the URL, and the URL in essence is the query to the API, so this is what the message looks like uh, to the API plus. And then with only a few lines of code, uh, what we can do is uh, get uh, the message back. So actually what you're seeing here is uh, just uh, the information of the, met the metadata of the article that have been returned from the API. So for example, ID, journal, publication date, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so now what happens with the publishers and their its API is that the URL and uh, the, the metadata that they return, they're in different formats. Uh, but you as a user, once you use Arcas, you don't really need to care about that. So for example, if I wanted to ping the API of nature, I could use the exact same code, but I would just change uh, this line. So instead of creating an instance of class, I would create an instance of nature. So I used uh, Arcas uh, in the first few months of my PhD. Uh, to collect uh, a big to collect metadata on the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, more specifically, I looked for articles that somewhere in the title or in the abstract, the word prisoner's dilemma existed. And I actually managed to retrieve 2,500 uh, metadata of articles. Uh, what you're seeing here is just the cumulative uh, sum over time. Uh, the first article was collected in 1950s and the latest one in 2018. But in total, I have 2,500 articles. And now that I have this metadata, uh, this data set, I started wondering, okay, what can I do with this? What are the questions uh, that I'm gonna answer? Uh, what can I understand about my fields uh, using these data sets? And I'm briefly gonna talk about two questions uh, that I have answered uh, using the data set. So the first one was, what do people write about on the field of the prisoner's dilemma? What are the hot topics uh, that my fellow researchers write about? And what are the topics that I maybe should be looking at? And in order to do that, I used a topping modeling technique. Uh, that is called Lantent Dirichlet Allocation. I'm going to be calling the method LDA from now on, so I don't have to mispronounce it again. Uh, so LDA is a topic modeling technique. So in essence, what the technique does, it takes a bunch of documents. In our case, the documents are the abstracts of the data sets, so 2,500 different abstracts. And we have to specify the number of topics. In this example, I say two. And then what LDA does is that it finds the words that are associated with each topic and their weights, as you can see here. So in answers, topics are distributions over words. So now some words can exist in more than one topic. In this example, game exists within topic one and topic two, but has a different weight. And there are some words that only exist in one topic and on the other. For example, population exists within topic two, but it does not within topic one. But all of these are not minorly retrieved, though the, the, the number of topics two has been uh, minorly um, oh, typed in, uh, the algorithm returns the words and the weight. So, like I said, topics are distribution of the words, and actually now documents, abstracts, are distribution of the topics. Uh, so, for example, if we had uh, an abstract, if we had a document, um, that he said, the social network of agents, uh, we can find how much each topic contributes to that abstract. Uh, so for example, using the weights from before and the words within the abstract, we can see that the topic one uh, contributes 0 0.30 to this specific document, where topic two, 0 0.20, 0 0.2. So this is what we're doing. We're taking one document and we, we um, 
we're generating a vector for that document. Uh, if we wanted to assign uh, the document a specific topic, then we would assign it to the topic that has the highest contribution. So for example, this abstract would be assigned to topic one. So one of the questions again then was, uh, is two the right topic? Is it's two the right number of topics? Uh, it was actually just an example. And in order to find the right number of topics, we have to do a bit of experimentation. Uh, and there are a lot of measures uh, other that you can use. I use the coherence score. Uh, in my research, I run a series of experiments where the number of topics change between 2 and 20. And here I'm just illustrating between 2 and 8. And what we can see is that the coherence scores uh, says uh, that 6 is the appropriate number of topics. The coherence scores is, um, is a validation measure. How well does LDA perform? And what is actually measuring is the similarity of the top words uh, within a topic. So a positive number is good uh, because the words that are highly similar are within one topic. Um, and that is a good thing because it means that the documents have been, the topics have been partitioned uh, correctly. Um, so six uh, was the appropriate number of topics based on the coherence score. Uh, but actually I had to do some manual investigation um, after that. So what I did see was that within two topics, uh, when the number of topics was six, was there was a lot of overlapping. There was some overlapping uh, within uh, the words. Uh, associated with the topics. And by looking at some of the documents that have been assigned to these two topics, I could see that the research that we're talking about uh, was quite similar. Uh, so there was some overlapping between those two. So I decided after a manual investigation uh, that the appropriate number uh, of topics was five instead of six. So I carried out my research using five. So I used the 2,500 different um, abstracts and I perform LDA and here are the results that came out of LDA. So these are the top words associated with the five identified topics. If you're a bit um, familiar with the prisoner's dilemma research, uh, some of these will, uh, you will immediately go, yes, I can see them being uh, in one topic. So for example, cooperation network population evolutionary is just evolutionary game theory or networks. Uh, social behavior study experiments uh, is just uh, a bunch of papers uh, that use humans to simulate the game. Uh, here we have game strategy player agent, uh, which is more my type of research, uh, which is uh, using machines, uh, using coded strategies uh, to simulate uh, rounds of the game. And then there were two that was, there were, it was not exactly immediate uh, what type of research they were doing. For example, individual, group, good and high. Uh, and again, what I did was I, I manually looked at the documents that have been assigned to this topic and um, more than one, of course. Uh, and then I understood uh, what the topic was about. Uh, so this is about using the prisoner's dilemma to uh, formulate biological problems, uh, problems in biology. And lastly, model theory system problem uh, was again using the prisoner's dilemma as a model, but of real life problems now, uh, well, biological problems are also real. Uh, uh, real life problems, uh, but it did not include biological problems. Uh, it was just other problems like operational research and et cetera, et cetera. So that was the first questions, uh, the, the first question that I managed uh, to answer with the data set. And the second one I'm briefly going to touch upon is, is the prisoner's dilemma a collaborative field? So the second thing I wanted to look was like, okay, people that write on my field, how do they write? Do they write alone? Uh, do they write with many people? Uh, or not. And in order to do that, I created uh, a co-authorship network. So from the metadata, the metadata that I've collected, uh, the list of authors is included. Uh, so what I can actually do is create a network where each node is an author. I'm actually a, a node myself on this network. Uh, uh, I should find me and point me out next time. And if two nodes have a orange line between them, it means that the, these, those two people have written together. And because now this is a network, there's a lot of analysis and a lot of measures that we can throw at and that we can understand uh, about the interaction of those nodes. Um, very briefly, and the easiest method that we can look at is the average degree. So if you only write on the prisoner's dilemma, uh, on average, how many collaborators do you have? And the answer is three. So during the lockdown, if my mom is worried that all I do is work, uh, I'll tell mom, don't worry. On average, research says that I'll speak to at least three people. Um, so both these questions uh, with further analysis and with uh, a bit further measures and a better explanation, I guess, uh, has led to, uh, to a manuscript. 
uh, is currently available on archive. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, please have a look. Uh, my co-author is uh, Dr. Lisa Knight, who's also my PhD supervisor, was my PhD supervisor. And uh, this is all for me today. Um, this is my Twitter handle. This is my supervisor, my co-author's uh, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, this is my uh, website where I'll be posting uh, the slides and a Jupyter notebook uh, because I didn't show any of the codes to perform LTA. Uh, I'll have a Jupyter notebook there as well, uh, but I will also um, share it on the Meetup uh, as well, so you can find it. Uh, so if you want to take a print screen of a slide, I suggest uh, this is uh, the one. But thank you, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you very much for the presentation, Nicoletta. Uh, would you mind uh, copying the uh, link to your homepage on the, the meetup afterwards? Or yes, now? Yes. When you... No, um, after audit, because I haven't uploaded the slides. Uh, once I upload the slides, I will paste the URL link to the meetup. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now uh, we're going to have a, a quick break. Uh, let, let me, sorry, let me just check if there were any questions. I, I see one, why, are we, why not do that right now? So Adam asks, thank you for the great presentation. Oh, sorry, now, now I had just disappeared. Okay, thank you for the great presentation. What are the limitations for paper met metadata and collection from the publisher's API? Fantastic. Um, there, is, there is some limitation as um, you can constantly ping some APIs. Uh, there are some rate limits, uh, but they have implemented, uh, well, back then when, the, when I first implemented the library and the, the, pub, the publisher's APIs, uh, there is a rate limit. So it, the code itself would pose uh, for, let's say, for three seconds if the API asks that it has to be um, pinged every three seconds. So that is one limitation. Uh, the other limitation is that at least two APIs that are implemented uh, within Alcas uh, need a key. Um, you can sign up and get a key. I did that personally, uh, but I don't know if that's an academics thing. I was a student, I can't remember that, but you can definitely get a key uh, and then you can communicate uh, with these libraries. And Alcas knows that these publishers need uh, an API key, so it will just ask you to insert it. Uh, so that is the second limitation and what other limitations are they? Um, boop, 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 boop. And I remember once um, collecting enough from IEEE that I had to stop for a day, even though I had a rate limit. Uh, so maybe some uh, APIs will you know, stop you from collecting uh, over the course of a day and you'll have to start again uh, the next day. Uh, but these are the limitations I can come up with, I can think of right now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we, we had a couple of questions uh, that were asked during the chat. I think they were mainly for Ryan uh, uh, and I think my uh, uh, fellow volunteer Leandro has collected them all. And at the same time, we are, we are almost all the way through the break. What I would suggest is just um, that Leandro, if you don't mind, I will uh, co coordinate, let you coordinate the question and answer uh, session. And afterwards we have a very quick break and sort of aim to reconvene at maybe 20 past eight. So in, in sort of like six to, to eight minutes. Um, two more very short things that I wanted to announce um, uh, before we uh, uh, move to the questions. Um, I forgot to say that in the beginning. So we are recording this meeting uh, I, I know there were a couple of people having audio problems. Very sorry about that. We'll find the recording afterwards on the PyData YouTube channel. And number two, um, uh, if you are interested in donating directly to uh, NumFocus and PyData, there is a link which takes you straight to their donation page. So I'm going to post this link on the chat right now during the break. Please consider uh, donating and supporting open source software development. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Leandro. Yep. Can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so there were two questions uh, for Ryan. Uh, one is uh, lots of focus on uh, neural networks for NLP. 
What's your opinion on more traditional approaches uh, like the FIDF followed by XGBoost, CutBoost, or similar? Very good. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I just chose a neural net example for that, but uh, if the problem can be solved, uh, just like um, uh, just like Matt said, uh, if, one, if you, if you don't need NLP to solve the problem, that's, that's kind of a first step. Uh, and then um, from there, if you can use a simpler model, um, a you know, smaller model, uh, then, then that's the way to go. Just as an example for scan detection, um, my go-to model is random forest. And in that case, um, it's not even a matter of using TF idea, but for a hand selected. Ryan, I'm sorry, you're. I'm sorry, you're difficult to understand, at least on, on my side. I think maybe your microphone is moving. Yeah, maybe the microphone is a little bit far away. Is this, yeah. is this better? Yeah, far better. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, I don't know how much you heard, so I just want to start with So, just like Matt said, um, so I'm, I'm sorry, still, it's still, uh, now that you started it, it was a little bit worse. No, no. Uh, let me rejoin on my laptop. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? You can go to no, if you, I think if you, yeah, it was better for a little bit. Okay, um, let's give uh, Ryan a few minutes to set up again and, uh, get, and have a very short break, three minutes break, uh, just enough time to uh, get a tea and to stretch your legs. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry, to repeat the question. Oh, it's alright. Uh, so no, I think uh, the question. I think I think think you're at the question is um, why why go big when you can start small? I think is the uh, the core of the question. And like Matt said, uh, if you can first of all avoid using NLP and uh, find some some uh, just quick rules to solve your problem, that's that's not a bad way to go. But as far as using uh, more traditional machine learning models. Um, that's always a good good place to start if uh, if if the the task at hand uh, would benefit from that. Just as an example, I use um, my my go to model is random forest when it comes to spam detection, um, and I don't even use TF-IDF for that, but more hand selected features uh, to make it more generalized, like um, the length of words and how many uh, um, uppercase versus lowercase there is in punctuation, um, which I guess has, you have to have a meta understanding of the language and you have to kind of look at the, the data set and task at hand to be able to do that. But yeah, if you can start small, go small. Not everything needs deep learning. Okay, thanks for that. So the next question is, uh, well, thanks for the great presentation. What are some of your top debugging tips for language models? 
Uh, top debugging tips. Um, I, I think it comes, for me at least, it comes down to recognizing patterns in the errors. Um, and that's not just looking at the text itself, but more um, what types of, of words and categories and sentences are, um, are you having problems with? Are you having problems with proper nouns? Are you having problems with, uh, uh, with slang? Or are you having problems with, um, for example, um, uh, words that have a lot of grammatical words in it? Um, or if there's, uh, if you're, let's say you're, you're reading a text and you notice there's a lot of uh, sarcasm that it's having trouble with. And that, that would be a place to stop, step back and be like, okay, what, what can I do to this model or the system to put this information in there? Or how can I adjust to it? So it's, it's finding, finding, um, finding the, the linguistic patterns that there may or may not be. Usually there is a linguistic answer I found though. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that. These are all the questions I think that we had uh, pending. Um, over to you, Ole, if you want to restart maybe so we don't get too much overtime. Yes, yeah, that sounds good. So the next speaker is Nick Radcliffe from uh, Stochastic Solutions and the PyData chapter in Edinburgh. Um, and Nick is going to speak to us about gen test automatic test generation for arbitrary programs with tdda all right so is that working can people hear me can people see this yes i can hear uh, you and see the slides looks great excellent so yes, uh, thank you, Ollie. So I'm Nick Radcliffe from, as Ollie says, uh, the Edinburgh Pi Data, and also Stochastic Solutions is my, I guess what we'd now call a data science company. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about everyone's favourite topic, testing, um, and in particular um, the gen test functionality that's kind of available in the TDDA open source library that we maintain. Um, so some of you, I hope, will have heard of the TDDA library. It's available on PyPI, so you can pip install TDDA. Uh, and it's also available in source form from GitHub, which you'd need if you wanted to try out the stuff I'm showing this evening, because it's on a branch at the moment. Um, TDDA stands for Test Driven Data Analysis. And it's really a whole collection of uh, support for testing data processes, or, or perhaps more accurately for testing data and data processes. So up to this point, we've really described it as having two and a half main components. Um, the first one is for checking data, for verifying data, if you like, using constraints. Uh, and so there's functionality in there both for generating constraints and for verifying data against those constraints. Um, there's also uh, support for extending both uh, Python's unit test and PyTest for testing data processing using reference tests, which are kind of more at the system or integration testing end of things. Now, particularly, the support is really there for uh, helping you test things where the output may be large or complex, or you can't generate it by hand, or it might have stochastic elements that change from time to time and that sort of thing. Um, and there's the sort of half component is something called RexPy, which is part of what we developed in order to do the data checking, uh, which, and, and what RexPy does is it generates regular expressions from example strings. And that turns out to be sufficiently useful that uh, we, we kind of talk about it as its own thing. So if you like, um, the TDA library currently is two automated things. The, you, you, can, you can look at the data, uh, data checking stuff as a sort of box that you feed data into and it spits out a set of constraints and verifying code against those constraints for new data. Uh, there's RexPy, which you uh, kind of feed a set of strings and it spits out, in the ideal case, one regular expression or if it's less successful, several regular expressions that relatively tightly cover those strings. 
but up to now, the testing support has been manual. And what I'm going to show you tonight is some kind of alpha beta type stuff for automating that process, where the idea is that you feed in code, uh, at least conceptually any code, and it spits out hopefully useful comprehensible tests. I pause for applause at this point, but obviously that's difficult over, over this system, so I'll just move on. Um, so what we mean by reference testing is, um, and it's very closely connected to uh, what the other side of the community, the R community, tends to call reproducible research. There's some of that here too. And the idea here really is that if you have any kind of, um, really any kind of program or um, system that you've developed, but particularly we're thinking about analytical processes of some kind, whether it's a machine learning model, a scoring system, a reporting system, or whatever. Um, it's quite a good idea to record the inputs, to capture your process in some executable form as a script or whatever, uh, and to capture the outputs from your example inputs, uh, which might be data sets or numbers or graphs or models or decisions or whatever. Um, and I guess those three things really are, are the core of reproducible research. And the idea is then you make those available to other people to verify your, uh, your research. Um, TDDA goes a bit further than that and suggests that it's a good idea to uh, capture a ver or develop a verification process, a diff process, if you like, to check that the inputs actually really do generate exactly the outputs you expect when you run your code. Uh, either the identical outputs or if the outputs have variable components, then equivalent but correct outputs. Um, and there are various objections to this which I'll move swiftly over. Uh, and the idea with TDDA gen test is that it helps you do that because many people believe that testing is really useful but don't actually really enjoy writing tests. Um, so the idea with GenTest is that it's the same process. You still have to record the inputs and capture the script. But GenTest, as your sort of friendly testing robot, will automatically capture the outputs for you and more critically, uh, write your test and develop the verification procedure for you so that you can uh, test that nothing has gone wrong with your uh, code. Um, so the model is, you know, you have something, you have your classification script or whatever that's wrapped up in a shell script. Uh, you feed in uh, sure classify dot sure or whatever to gen test, and it spits out um, a test script with one or more tests in it and uh, a set of reference outputs that it uses for checking that things are correct. Uh, and I can nearly hear you all saying, really, is that possible? Um, so obviously what I'll do is a demo because that always seems like a good idea when you're doing something live to a few hundred people. So uh, here we go. So we have a very simple script. You'll notice it's not in Python. It could be Python, but GenTest really copes with anything. Obviously, it's not going to cope with uh, like mobile applications or whatever, but any, anything that you can execute from a command line. Uh, this is a very simple one that just kind of says hello and writes a little bit of stuff to a file and stuff. Um, I'm going to run that. Um, and indeed, it says hello. UK, this is GenTest running on torso.local, my machine. Um, actually, I gave this talk before and I'd just been in Munich where the weather was better. It's actually beautiful in Edinburgh tonight, but there you go. And then it's got a date, which is the kind of thing that changes. Uh, and it's also got um, a file. And that file has a random number in it, which also therefore is potentially a problem for a test. So if we wanted to test this, you know, we'd have a little bit of work to do. Let's see what GenTest does. So the way I'm going to do it, I have, Gen, uh, I have the TDDA library installed uh, from source, and I'm on the GenTest branch, which is where you have to be at the moment. We will move it on to master before too long. Uh, and I'm just going to say TDDA GenTest, which brings up the wizard. You can, you can not use the wizard if you prefer. And the first thing you have to do is specify what code you want it to test. So we want it to test um, sure example one dot sure. But this could be anything. Uh, and then I'm really just going to say yes to everything else. So you have to give a name for the test script, but it suggests one. Um, it's suggesting that it will test any files that get written during the execution of this code, which seems sensible uh, under the current directory. 
Um, it's also going to look in your temp directory, which defaults to the shell variable tempter. Um, you can specify extra stuff, it, extra places it might not think to look, but we're not going to bother doing that. And it also asks, well, should I look at standard output, which seems like a good idea? Should I check standard error, which seems like a good idea? Um, should the exit code be zero? Yes, it definitely should. Uh, and how many times should I run the script to see what happens? Well, two is a pretty small number, but that's what we'll go with. Uh, and having accepted all that, we could obviously change things along the way. Um, it gives us a little summary of what it's done. And what it's done, we didn't need file one, that was just the output from when I ran it by hand. What it's actually added is uh, it's generated this code, test shirt example one shirt.i, and it's also created a directory called ref. And if we look in ref, uh, it's generated, okay, so you can have several things in one place, but under shirt example one shirt, it's created three files, file one, um, stood uh, and stood out, which are what it expects to be in those things. So, um, Let's see what happens if we run the test, which we could do with um, PyTest, obviously, but I'm just going to use unit test. Um, so if we run the test, uh, five tests pass, which I guess is good. Um, if we look at the code it's generated, um, well, so, so the first thing that might, might, might be interesting about that, it, I mean, I guess it's not completely obvious what it's done, but uh, what it's done, is it's run your program. Uh, it does that in the class setup. Uh, it's executing it here. And then it has five tests, the first of which in this case tests that no exception was generated when you ran the code. The second of which tests that the exit code is zero. The third of which tests that the, what it printed to stood out is what we expected. Uh, and what's interesting about this is it's not just checking that the output was exactly what we wanted. It's using some of the functionality in the TDDA library to say, well, actually, there's something that I don't think necessarily always ought to be the same. This is today's date and time. Uh, and there's also the host name, uh, torso.local, which seems like the kind of thing that might be over specific to the current environment. So I'm not going to check that the output's exactly what I expected. I'm going to use this assert string correct method that says, check the outputs what I expect, except that if you see something that isn't torso.local where I was expecting to see that, I'll accept something else. And the same with the date. Um, it checks studer, there's nothing on studer, so it's just checking that's empty. And it's also checking the file. And in that case, uh, it's used rexpy to generate a regular expression. So it said have a number, but it hasn't written the exact number into the test script. It's written, well, it looks like it's a five digit number. Um, so we're just going to say zero to nine five times. Um, and that's what's going on. Now, if I keep running this test repeatedly, eventually we would probably get a failure, uh, but we probably don't have time for that. The reason we get a failure is sometimes it won't be a five digit number it generates, it will be a four digit, or if we're really unlucky, a three digit. And in fact, that's what's happened here. So we got quite lucky that happened quickly. We could obviously easily edit the code if we wanted to, but the other nice thing to notice is that it's not just told us that the test failed, it's also told us what command we would want to use to see what the difference actually was. I'll just change that to open diff. Um, and so we see that the difference is indeed it generated a four digit number instead of a five digit number. So the next thing we might do is go in and change that regular expression to be four or five or indeed um, one to five, I guess or one to six or whatever to uh, specify what we want. So that's, that's the essence of GenTest. Um, I said I'd be quick, so I will go back if I can find my talk, which I can't because it's covered up. Um, so that's, that's the essence of uh, what the GenTest functionality in TDDA does. Um, it works by using a whole bunch of heuristics, by using the uh, regular expression generation to spot variations in code when you run it several times. It uses knowledge of the environment to say, I know where you're running this code. So if there are outputs that seem specific to the path, uh, to the directory you're running in, I'm, I'm not going to um, hardwire those. Same with things like dates and times. It, know when it knows when it's running. It knows who the user is and stuff like that. So using all this, it makes what I'm boldly going to call intelligent decisions about how and what to test. Um, though when I say intelligent, I mean kind of somewhere probably north of the intelligence of the US president, but maybe south of the intelligence of the New Zealand prime minister. Um, 
that's me. Uh, if you are interested, that's my email. Uh, I guess you can't see it, but uh, the sites are available here on tda.info, which is a blog about this stuff. Um, so you can find that. The code's available on GitHub. As I say, check out the Gentest branch. <laughs> check out, as in Git, check out the Gentest branch if you want to try this stuff. There's a Slack channel you're welcome to join if you're interested in. It's very quiet and low volume. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at various different places. Um, I think that's me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. Are there any questions in the audience? Okay. When do you think a gen test is going to be ready for production? You said uh, it's going to be <laughs> soon. I think not shortly after the robots take over the world, only. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, to be honest, uh, I gave this talk about a year ago and it hasn't moved on a whole lot, but that's just because I haven't actually given any time to it. Um, I think actually there's no reason why it shouldn't move. The only reason it hasn't moved on to master is it comes off a branch that isn't ready to go on to master. And what I really need to do is separate the two things out and cherry pick the right stuff and get it back onto master. Um, it, I don't think it's fully ready for prime time, but it certainly is useful enough that I've actually used it to generate useful tests for various command line things that I've generated. Um, it, it needs a lot more work to be, um, say, as intelligent as the New Zealand prime minister. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So if there are, no more questions for Nick, then uh, please use the use chat if, if you have any questions that you remember later on. And if there are no more questions right now, I'm going to move on to the next talk. So for the final talk, it's my great pleasure to introduce Luciano Resende from IBM, uh, from the IBM Open Source Data Science and uh, um, Technology Center, and uh, Luciano is going to introduce us to Elira, which is an extension of JupyterLab for AI. Welcome, Luciano. Hey, thanks. Uh, well, uh, thanks everybody for having me. Uh, let me start my sharing my screen here. Just a second. Okay. I'm assuming you guys can see my screen, can you hear me okay? If not, please let me know. <coughs> so today we're gonna be talking about Elira. I'm gonna introduce Elira and I'm gonna use a uh, scenario that a couple of my friends are, are working around uh, COVID analytics to illustrate some of the challenges on building some of like a data science projects and how Elira can help with that. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Luciano Hezengi. I'm originally from Brazil, but actually um, living for about 20 years in the US. I'm currently at California. Uh, I work for IBM in a group called CODATE, which stands for uh, Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. And if you need to reach me, uh, here is information that you can use. Um, I'm usually available and, and, and very uh, quick on responding, uh, except for like uh, time zone differences, but feel free to reach me. Um, I know we are running out of time, so I'm going to skip a couple of these slides, but I only thing that I want to mention here is that a lot of like times we talk about IBM and we, we look into that as like a lot of like proprietary software coming out. Uh, we do a lot of with open source, pretty much uh, we use open source in all of the projects, but we also contribute uh, to multiple projects. Uh, the group that I work on uh, is called uh, CODE. Uh, we started a few years ago as a Spark Technology Center where we were working on uh, analytics projects related to Spark and in, in, in the Spark ecosystem. Uh, we started seeing that we were moving more towards AI, different projects and, and, and bigger scopes. Uh, so that's why the rename to CODE uh, to basically go around what we were, uh, represent better what we were doing. And uh, let's go more to the focus of this talk and talk uh, and what we're gonna talk today. So I'm gonna introduce a little bit of like the scenario that we're gonna use, uh, then talk about the Lyra and walk through the scenario uh, around um, 
exposing some of the functionality that is available in the Lyra. Uh, so uh, we are currently living in unprecedented times and uh, being kind of like a, this pandemic brought a lot of like uncertainty uh, and many things were new and there were a lot of like um, uh, questions that were being raised information that we wanted to kind of like uh, start looking to to find answers to those questions. And of course, I mean, being sort of like a tech, tech guys, uh, first thing we start doing, we start looking for data, we start looking for uh, how we can use that data that is available to start getting some answers. Uh, and that's exactly what a couple of uh, friends that I have did. Uh, yes, we as an IBM, we did a lot of other efforts with the pandemic. We provide worldwide analytics, uh, data sets. We introduced uh, uh, COVID to our kind of like a, a call for code challenge. But uh, our colleagues start doing some uh, analytics themselves. Uh, Fred Reyes and Romeo uh, Kinsler, they both work on Coday. And they start looking to uh, kind of like a regional data sets to try to answer some of the questions that they have, uh, particularly around where they were living. After a little while, they kind of like combined the efforts that they were doing and increased the scope to kind of like a try to get insights both from uh, a US type of uh, kind of like scope, but also Romeo uh, lives in, in Europe. So he, he was also interested in Europe and that's what they started using. Everything that they are doing is available uh, is available in uh, a public GitHub. So I'll, I'll sh share links at the end. Uh, so it's all available and all kind of like open source as well. Uh, when they started looking to this, they started seeing a, a few challenges. Uh, so like, for example, uh, how to break apart the tasks that are expensive to run. So like data preparation take a while, but once you have that data, it's kind of like okay to, to start uh, looking to some of the analytics. Uh, these data are being frequently updated. Uh, and then once you have information, how do you start uh, submitting and, and making those kind of like sharing and collaborating with others? Uh, so we started looking to this uh, and we, we saw that it fitted very well with the concept of like pipelines. And Elena was introducing the visual editor to build uh, notebook-based AI pipelines. It simplifies the conversion of multiple notebooks into batch jobs and workflows. Uh, with the pipeline uh, editor that, that Elena was providing, uh, we could start at adding multiple notebooks, uh, define dependencies between them, which will influence kind of like the execution order, as well as populate additional properties required to run those notebooks. Uh, you could define, for example, a Docker image, uh, which basically defines the runtime, which was, is going to be used for running those. Uh, you can define dependencies that you may need, or you also can define kind of like a, what are the outputs of these kind of like tasks. Uh, so we talked it a lot, and I started helping them uh, basically uh, managing or, or, or creating the pipelines. Uh, via Elira to put together all of this uh, nice work that they, they, they were doing uh, in, in, in this project. So we can see here, so like phases that we identified, so like a data preparation and then kind of like a model uh, training, model validation, model deployment, model uh, testing, which is kind of like a high level phases of like an AI pipeline, translating to how this then becomes into Elira you can see that we started fitting the nodes, uh, defining the dependencies, and then also uh, defining the properties that each of those needs, the configuration. Uh, but uh, kind of like what is Elira? Um, Elira is a set of like AI-centric extensions for JupyterLab. Uh, we originally announced Elira on April 29th, so it's sort of like a recent project, but we have been working on that for uh, over six months. Uh, and we built on top of Jupyter Lab, which is also uh, uh, available for a while. So even though it's announced recently, uh, we have a, a few good set of like uh, functionalities available and, and to a certain extent, uh, uh, it's not a prototype, it's really more like a, a, something that you can start playing with it. A lot of people ask me about the name of the project, what does that mean? 
Uh, so we tried to do a, a word play with uh, kind of like one of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, we look it into uh, uh, all of those and, and Jupiter has a quite a, a lot. Uh, and the only one that really didn't have like a, a, a anything protecting or, or trademarks or anything was uh, uh, Elyra. And, 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 and we basically introduced the Y like in Jupiter that introduces the Y there. So just for those that uh, have questions about the name. Um, <clears throat> so we are at pay data. So I'm assuming everybody here have uh, heard about Jupyter notebooks and, and know about Jupyter notebooks. Uh, but for those that are not familiar with notebooks, uh, it, it enables data scientists, machine learning engineers, and AI developers to combine code and documentation, uh, enabling interactive uh, code executions, and the ability to combine the results into compelling visualizations, all within the unified environment and uh, entirely ac accessible by non-technical persons of a web browser. Uh, if you are familiar with notebooks, there is the classic notebook that is, has been there for a while. There is also Jupyter Lab, which is kind of like the new front end for Jupyter notebooks. Uh, it looks much more like an IDE, provides the ability to work on multiple notebooks in or different documents uh, at the same time. Uh, Jupyter Lab is also very extensible and the functionality can be, uh, new functionality can be easily added to the platform. And that's why uh, uh, we started using Jupyter Lab and we started building layer on top of Jupyter Lab. Uh, for those, uh, this is just like Jupyter Lab, you can see uh, this is the UI for Jupyter Lab. Uh, you have different tabs, like you can see File Explorer, uh, you have widgets, um, console terminal, uh, tabled workspaces, all those now become tabs and not like single pages as in the previous notebook. Uh, you have text editors and, and much more. Elira then starts extending JupyterLab for AI, aimed to help data scientists, machine learning engineers, and AI developers through the model development lifecycle complexities. <coughs> uh, some of the capabilities that we added to Elira, so uh, we talked about the pipelines, uh, you can also submit notebooks as a jobs, and we are gonna go into the details or, or look into how that works uh, on the, the live demo after a couple of slides. Uh, there is also hybrid runtime support that enables you to run uh, uh, notebooks locally or remotely uh, seamlessly, uh, that allows you to leverage cloud uh, resources or share GPUs from a cluster, et cetera, very easily. Uh, Python script execution. So now you can uh, not only edit your Python scripts, but execute from, from within the Jupyter lab and also leverage the hybrid runtime support and run not only locally, but using cloud resources. And of course, you want to be able to, to track versioning and, and share your um, uh, work, so we have integration with Git where uh, it enables you to, to, to very easily track versions there. So enough of like a, a sort of like a, a theory or, or, or let's really look into like how all of these uh, uh, work together. Let me start. Um, just play. Let me go here. <coughs> okay. So uh, Elira is available, and, and if, if you can see here, it's available on github.com slash Elira AI. Uh, we have a few uh, repositories there. Uh, we have Elira, uh, which is our main code repository. Canvas allows you to, to draw the, the, the pipeline flow. AFP notebook for integrating with Kubeflow pipelines. And then some examples uh, in community uh, things here. Uh, if we go to Elira, which is the main repository, uh, you will start uh, having the readme shows you kind of like the capabilities. Uh, you can see that uh, there are a few new capabilities that we have added after we uh, kind of like a, became open source. Uh, so these are uh, coming into play and then it's kind of like getting very uh, good feedback. If you want to start playing with this, you can uh, use pip install. Uh, you can uh, use a Docker image. There is the binder, uh, which will just build an Elyra environment for you right away. And uh, Conda install is coming when we do our next release. All the recipe and everything is now is there. Uh, 
Uh, our uh, documentation is available on the read the docs. You can go there where you can see uh, all of the uh, uh, kind of like overview and get it started, but you also have recipes if you want to uh, integrate that. Let's say if you already have a Jupyter uh, Hub uh, environment, or if you're doing, for example, uh, just local development, you want to have a KFP to test your pipelines. <coughs> uh, the COVID notebooks is available on the Code organization uh, uh, in the COVID uh, notebook repository. And there is uh, very detailed instructions on how to set up your dev environment. Uh, but mainly what you need to do is have Conda set up and you can run environment.sh that will do everything for you. Once you have the setup done and you start, um, you start Jupyter Lab, you will see the COVID notebooks uh, directory. Uh, you will have uh, sort of like everything that you need to run uh, the COVID experiment here. But uh, the two directories that you need to know is the notebooks and the pipelines. Uh, notebooks has a list of like, all the notebooks that are used in these pipelines, and we have then uh, the pipelines directory that has uh, the EU uh, data pipeline and the US data pipeline. And we're going to focus on a, a little bit more complex here, which is the uh, US one. So, uh, first thing first, we need to get a good set of data. Uh, kind of like prepared for us to do any kind of like analytics. We, uh, let me just look at the times, okay. Uh, we go to uh, this ETL uh, US data. Uh, in this case, we are using uh, two uh, main kind of like uh, data sets here. Uh, the primary one, I think everybody knows, the John Hoppix uh, Data set, that's the main one that we use, but we found a few inconsistencies there. Uh, so we decided to also uh, add a secondary one, which is kind of like the New York Times. By combining the two, we, we sort of like try to minimize the gaps or, or make sure we, we have even uh, better date, data there. And this notebook then goes about kind of like a pre-processing the data and, and outputting at the end uh, some CSVs that are required or that are used later on for other projects. If we go back here, then we can uh, take a look at kind of like a, how we put this together. Uh, you can go into the properties and see, okay, we are running this on a Anaconda Python 3 environment. So particularly when we are using this, we identified uh, the requirement to bring your own environment. So we enable you to uh, configure your own kind of like a Docker images to use where you can play with any dependencies or anything special that you might need there. <coughs> and in this case, we don't have many dependencies. We are reading the um, data sets directly from, from the source, but we then generate the output file. So we start making this uh, uh, configured here. What it's gonna make then, uh, what Telari is gonna make is once you run this notebook, we'll make those uh, CSV and JSON, the, basically the output files are available for the next, um, next steps of the pipeline. Um, we also uh, start uh, looking into uh, census data and, and incorporating census data. And uh, when you have the pandemic kind of like data series and you start merging with uh, information that comes from the census, you now have population of the county, uh, income and distribution, demographics, uh, and how dense, dense the population of that county is. That significantly affects how you can interpret, start interpreting the facts that you have uh, uh, on on the data that you are seeing there, and that 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 gave uh, Fred and uh, Romeo uh, much more insights and much better uh, uh, interpretation of those data. Uh, and uh, after that, then you start seeing some of the analytics here. Maybe let me show. Oh, one thing I want to mention. <coughs> Uh, clean data. So one of the things that they identified also was that that on one data set they were seeing things like uh, uh, here where data were jumping up to a certain number, let's say, of deaths, but then coming back to zero. And they started seeing a, a inconsistencies on different places by started to merging the the uh, the uh, Hopping Kings uh, data set with the New York Times. They were able to kind of like a find some solution and work around for this type of gaps there. And then on the analytics side, uh, 
you can see, for example, then they started playing with uh, some of the analytics. In this case, they, they wanted to see how uh, things were uh, showing up. Uh, initially, it was very hard to understand. They started shifting kind of like the time series, uh, uh, zero day to coincide with the uh, New York, Manhattan, um, day zero. And that started then giving them a better kind of visualization of the data. And once they have all the pieces together, all kind of like things, uh, data were coming up and, and being updated very frequently. How do you go and get uh, uh, these to be running um, into kind of like a, uh, the, right, the right sequence very frequently and things like that? So the, the pipeline, once you submit the pipeline, you can put a name here, let's say, uh, high data, um, demo and you can select where you want to run that. And, and these, uh, these the, the current runtime that we are supporting is the Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, we have an alpha version for uh, uh, supporting uh, Apache Airflow as well. <coughs> but once you click OK here, what happens is we will package the pipeline uh, based on uh, the preferences that you have uh, put into each of the nodes. We identify uh, dependencies and other things that need to be sort of like a package it together to run, and we delegate uh, these to get run in the Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, packaging and all of that might take a little while, so I'm just gonna cancel. I have already submitted one, and we're gonna go directly to that. <coughs> uh, so the submitted pipeline, when it goes to um, KFP, will basically have a similar representation and all kind of like the dependencies together here. And uh, we we actually interested on the execution of that. So I add ex experiments. Uh, you will have a, a run created for that pipeline. And what you start seeing is all the nodes. You will, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to run end-to-end. Uh, -end. Uh, but then you can see, for example, log information and, and other things. If you are trying to maybe something broken and you want to figure out what happened, or you just want to see like the progress that is going, <coughs> once the pipeline uh, runs end-to-end, -end, uh, we have an associated uh, object storage. In that ob on that object storage, uh, all the dependencies have initially been put in there to run each of the notebook, but then you start also seeing uh, sort of like the, the results. So let me take a look here, uh, the, the one that we were just looking at, uh, I think it was this one. <coughs> but we have a representation of we have a, a representation uh, of that notebook that, that was run uh, into HTML, which is very easy for us to just take a look and see what's going on. But you also have the, the, the final IPYNB that you can then reuse, you can download or share with others. Uh, other than that, uh, we have a couple of other things on the, li on the Lyra. Let me uh, just double check, we have a few minutes. Uh, so I uh, mentioned to you guys, we, uh, the pipeline shows you basically multiple notebooks tied together. Uh, if what you're having is just one notebook, um, this case, I just have a linear regression uh, notebook here, uh, but maybe you're doing a model training that can take uh, hours, uh, even more than just a couple hours. You don't want to have your kind of like notebook stuck there waiting for that to, to happen. You can submit a notebook. Similarly, you will enter with uh, 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 kind of like the runtime configuration uh, that you want, uh, the image that you, you want to run that. Uh, and when you execute, we, we package this the same way. We, we add dependencies. Oh, in this case, there was uh, a, a output uh, the environment variable that you can fill if you need it. And uh, we will then package a kind of like a one node pipeline and submit the same way to Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, and in this case, we it's just a notebook. There isn't much to be added there. You can see that it gets uh, quickly submitted. Uh, you then have the kind of like a, a link directly to there and also information on where all the data is gonna be stored. Uh, I mentioned Python scripts. So, uh, if, for example, uh, when we were looking to the uh, COVID uh, experiment, we had inside the notebooks, we have some utility pythons that you can start adding to here. But sometimes you just have a script that you want to run. 
So in this case, I'm processing a data set that kind of like a, talks about Sacramento real estate sales. And I want to uh, ident uh, identify the, 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 the average price for a zip code. Uh, I can then select where I want to run this. These are sort of like a configurations, uh, kernel configurations. Um, and internally, what it's actually going to do is going to create a kernel environment and execute that. Uh, by doing that, we can leverage hybrid runtime and, and Python 3 might be running locally, but it might actually be running, let's say, on a cloud where you have access to things like GPU, more data, more CPU. And once I do a play here, uh, basically you will see that it's very transparent to where it's running. Uh, we'll do all the execution, uh, all the things that you need, and we'll bring back uh, the kind of like output that you need from that into here. <coughs> And, and, and that is very good. You don't have to go out to do uh, Python scripts and things like that, uh, and you get the results back here. Uh, and uh, last, uh, not last, but like let me, the last couple of things that I wanna bring up is, uh, let me go back to COVID here. This is actually uh, a Git repository that I cloned. You can see things that got changed. Uh, you can select a, a, a You can select here, you can add things to get staged or you can just see what has been changed. Uh, very easily to identify changes here. In this case, not, pretty much nothing uh, other than metadata files were changed. <coughs> Sorry, metadata information were changed. So uh, uh, it gives you a much better uh, visualization. And if you are just uh, kind of like a, a trying to, to start something fresh, something clean, uh, we can go uh, create new notebooks as, 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 as we always do. And we have introduced this notion of like a code snippets. Uh, code snippets are reusable pieces of code that, it, it, that usually you have to repeat itself very much. You don't have to type that very often. Uh, so let's say I want to do sort of like a, a, some uh, plots with matplotlib. I have some of the initialization codes here that I use very often. I can quickly just come create a new notebook, insert that uh, all. I, let me go and, and try to plot uh, uh, actually uh, a graph here. And you can, after you did that, you can start basically executing those cells. And voila, we have sort of like a, our graph here, very easy, we use it code. Uh, I have other uh, information here. I have a scenario here that is a Spark related. Uh, it's actually written in Scala, so uh, let me try to add here and see what's going to happen. So it's a little bit uh, intelligent. It identifies that you are using Python. Uh, it then allows you to uh, give you a warning that is, is, is really what you want to do. Uh, let me see if I do other things like I'm uh, creating a markdown and then I go to code snippets. Uh, I can, uh, for example, add this here. It identifies that I'm actually adding code to Markdown. It put kind of like a like a the right uh, uh, kind of like a wrapping around that. So it's sort of like a comment in your in your document. Uh, so this is a very high level uh, of like what we are doing with Elira. And the overall idea here is we want to be able to simplify and, and get things better, particularly for data scientists. Uh, that are coming to Jupyter Lab, that are doing AI and, and might not have necessarily uh, all the CS background or, or, or that, that needs to be involved on in DevOps uh, tasks related to the model training. Um, so uh, this, this is sort of it. I mean, uh, a lot of resources here. All that we are doing is uh, open source. You can go to github.com slash Elira dash AI, Elira, see all the code that we have. There is documentation there. A couple of other uh, videos related to this. So the announcement goes a little bit more deeper uh, on, on, on demo of different functionalities. Uh, for those that are interested on more on the analytics side of the COVID uh, scenario, uh, I also have a YouTube video from uh, Fred Rice uh, which goes into more of the details on the analytics side, uh, uh, what kind of like a, uh, uh, issues uh, he found with the data, how he solved that, uh, kind of like what are, what are some of the uh, uh, actual models and, and, and things on, uh, on pandas that he's 
using for uh, implementing that. He's more the data scientist and more kind of like the platform guy. So uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. I think we might still have a little bit of time or not uh, uh, for questions. Um, please, uh, thank you very much for the time. And thank, thank you very much for, for having me. Yes, thanks a lot for this talk, Luciana. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions in the audience, please? use the chat or the Q&A function to post them. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a question, Ole, if you allow me. Yes, sure. So um, I noticed that, that you can use uh, remote kernel execution, and you I think you mentioned uh, Docker. And how, how easy is it for you to kind of extend it to to have kind of more resources to take care of kind of a big chunk of, of jobs or to extend it or do you use something like Kubernetes or, or some platform like that? Good, good. That is probably another talk about another talk to go into that. But uh, yes, uh, let me show just one slide here. And oh, I'm not sharing. So internally, uh, when when we are doing the the hybrid runtime, uh, this is sort of like what's happening. And yes, we have support for both kind of like a non-containerized uh, platforms, like uh, just running on a Spark cluster, or in a Kubernetes environment. And, and we we usually recommend those, like if you are doing analytics. Uh, kind of like using the Spark cluster is better because you you basically uh, uh, playing with different data. Uh, if you are using things more like AI uh, in, in deep learning, uh, we recommend Kubernetes uh, mostly because you start in the isolation uh, one 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 notebook or one job uh, needs some sort of kind of like a, a TensorFlow background to to run, where others might be using just kind of like a and Python or PyTorch and you name it. So what we do here is we have integration with Jupyter Hub to spawn your uh, notebooks, but we also have the ability to like uh, bring your own notebook where you say, well, I'm using my laptop and I'm just gonna connect remotely, which is mostly what I was doing today. <coughs> uh, in this case, uh, there is a piece that we created a, a few years ago and it's a project at Jupyter called Jupyter Enterprise Gateway that then enables you to start kind of like either doing Spark and Kubernetes or uh, just playing vanilla uh, kernels. And what it does is it creates a pod for every uh, notebook or kernel that you start starts up. Uh, that allows you flexibility to choose what image you want, but also allows you to, uh, if you have something that needs GPUs and are running for, for two, three hours, once it's done, those uh, resources are are, are returned back where you might have other jobs that are running uh, uh, much longer and don't need those resources so the, you can just use more memory or more 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 CPU so yes uh, uh, and, and Jupyter Enterprise Gateway is what allows you to to give all that flexibility uh, to to the data scientist and, and to the environment cool thank you very much the same seems very interesting to kind of reducing time for new people join your team and, and those sorts of scenarios. Yeah, it looks very interesting. Yes, I think uh, one of the, the kind of like uh, why we started this was exactly that. We, we needed some kind of like a self-service analytics platform so that people can come and just say, I need a, a, an environment. But we also saw that the data scientist kind of usage pattern was more like, yeah, I come here, I'm doing some experiment, I might go to coffee, come back three hours later, and all those resources were, were always being used. These allow uh, uh, much more control uh, and granularity of like what resources you use for how long. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much to uh, Luciano and all the other speakers. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there were lots of people 
involved in the background as well that that helped to prepare the meetup and helped with the organization so thanks a lot for uh, to everyone who was involved uh, the help was very much appreciated